Recently, there was a video of a guy taking a collapse in Iceland where he spun the glider and ultimately crashed into the rocks below. In today's video, I wanted to discuss the mistakes that were made that led to that collapse happening, the spin, and ultimately what led to him landing in those rocks. I wanna make it clear that this video is just for educational purposes. I'm not making this to criticize the pilot, nor do I wish any ill intent on him. I'm super glad that he was okay. He did sustain injuries, but I hope him nothing but a successful and fast recovery. With all of that being said, let's get started with the video. The first thing I want to do is I want to analyze the situation. So starting off, the pilot is flying around in Iceland, which is a beautiful place to go paramotoring and full of incredible geological formations. Now, the incredible geological formations, to me, means several things. Number one, that means cliffs, that means mountains, that means rocks, that means anything where there is ground coming up out of the ground like a mountain. Now, the reason that large geological locations are an important thing to point out is because things like mountains, cliffs, rocks, trees, houses, buildings, anything produce what's called rotor. And rotor, for those that are unaware, is the spinning, twirling, whirling air on the lee side or the downwind side of an object. The way that we describe that in our training school here at Backcountry PPG is a rock in a stream analogy. If you put a rock in a really smooth, calm stream, you're going to notice that the water downwind of that rock is going to be swirling, twirling, and white for quite a ways down the river. Now, the same thing applies to every single object in the sky including yourself. The air as it blows through you is going to get disrupted and the air downwind of you is going to be very turbulent for a ways until it spoons out. Now, back to the exact situation. Here the pilot is flying on the coastline of Iceland. Now the reason the coastline is important is because more often than not, on the coast of anything, on the waterfront of anything, on the ocean, there's going to be wind. This is usually because the ocean is a smooth, large body of water that produces smooth, steady air blowing into the shoreline. Now, that's important because we can take from that that there's probably wind blowing on shore from the water. The reason that single piece of information is important is because if we now look at where the pilot was positioned in relation to the object that he was flying around and the wind, we can see that the pilot is flying right into the rotor of this object, All right? So the pilot is flying around on the beach. He's flying around on the coastline of the water with some wind, and he flies right into the rotor of an object. So that right there is the reason that the pilot found himself in this situation. Now let's take a look a little closer at exactly what happened when he took the collapse. Okay, so we know the pilot flies into rotor. Let's see what happens. He starts going into rotor, he takes a small tip collapse, and then all of a sudden, boom, he takes a full 50% collapse right here. We can see right here in this frame that the right side of the wing, probably more than 50%, just a little more than 50% of the wing has collapsed. Now, there's two ways to react to this. The first way you can react to this is, oh crap, everything's gonna fall out of the sky. The second way you can react to this, which is the better way, is okay, half the wing is no longer there, but the half that's flying is still flying, let's just keep flying the open side. The correct reaction in this moment and the correct inputs in this moment is not to try and recover the closed side, right? It is not to hammer really hard right break. The correct input when you take a collapse like this is to weight shift to the high side, right? Weight shift to the left and fly the left half of the wing to keep that side of the glider flying. As long as there's part of the wing flying, your job slash goal should be to continue to fly the open part of the wing. The wing naturally wants to recover, right? This glider naturally wants to be flying. The glider wants to be inflated with air. So if you give it time to refill itself with air and you focus on just flying the open side, eventually it is going to recover. It is going to reinflate and it is going to continue to fly because naturally it wants to. It's not fighting to fall out of the sky. No, no, no. It's it's fighting to recover from falling out of the sky. The, glide's nat the glider's natural instinct is to keep flying, not stop flying. So let's keep going and take a look at what happens. The glider collapses and let's pause the frame right here. 
So here we are, maybe a quarter second, maybe a half a second later. The glider is reopened, right? You can see the right side is now reopened and flying again. However, you can also see that the wing is now entering into a V shape behind the pilot. The pilot had applied very, very hard right brake in this moment. And that very hard right brake had stalled the half that had collapsed. Now I know that's a little weird, right? The side had collapsed. I didn't think you could stall the side that had collapsed. However, the side that collapsed reopened. And as it was reopening, the pilot was so heavy into those brakes that he then spun and stalled that side of the wing. So the left side is still flying straight. You can see it's still pointing in basically the same direction that it was. But the right side is now completely stalled. And the left side, because the right side is stalled, is going to enter into a spin, which is an acrobatic maneuver that some people mean to do, but in this case, he didn't mean to do. So now the left side is going to shoot forward following the right side. Let's keep going and see what happens. So now the glider enters into a spin. You can see right there, it just starts to go. The wing just starts to crack into that spin. And if we keep on going, we can watch as that glider enters into that rotation, which is a spinning rotation. The left side is chasing forward. The right side is sinking back. That is a almost picture perfect spin of the wing. Now there's a big difference between spin and spiral. Okay. In this situation, the glider was spinning, which is a negative maneuver. It was not spiraling, which is a positive maneuver. A spiral is when your glider is fully inflated and you turn really hard, getting it pointing down towards the ground. A spin is when you stall the wing and spin the glider in the stall. So the pilot had applied very hard right brake upon collapsing the wing. He had recovered from the collapse, but instead of just recovering from a collapse, he then entered into a spin. He now was no longer recovering from a collapse. He was recovering from a stall, which is a totally different thing. It's a totally different beast. Recovering from a collapse just simply means flying the high side and reinflating the collapse side. Recovering from a spin means recovering from a stall, which is working those hands up, getting the wing to shoot forward to refill of air and not exiting off access, causing yourself to go into a big collapse. Needless to say, recovering from a stall is a lot harder. You need more altitude. You need a lot more skill. And really, most paramotor pilots don't know how to do it because most paramotor pilots don't spend a lot of time doing SIV maneuvers like a spiral or a spin. In this situation, the pilot has entered into a spin. The chances of him being able to recover this spin at this altitude is very low. He may be able to recover, but a recovery is ultimately going to put him into the ground. The better plan of action right here would have been to throw a reserve. I personally, had you put me in this situation, I think I would have responded this way. This is how I would like to think I would have responded. As soon as I cracked the wing into a spin, I would have tried to throw the reserve. I like to think that if you had put me in that situation, as soon as it cracks into a spin, you throw your reserve. A general rule of thumb that I have is if I'm under, say, one to 200 feet and I spin or stall the wing, I'm going to throw the reserve. I personally do not feel 100% confident in my ability to recover from a stall or a spin under 100 feet. It depends on the situation, of course. But if I do enter into that stall, I do enter into that spin, and it's because I was in this rotor, I'm immediately going to throw that reserve because there's chances, the likelihood, the probability, the statistical likelihood of me being able to recover the wing and continue flying safely is less than me throwing the reserve and coming down safely. I would so rather have thrown a reserve in this spot. Now, he may not have been high enough for that reserve to fully open. We can see right here, he's maybe 50 feet off the ground, right? He's maybe 50 feet. But let's say the, 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 the reserve half inflated and set him down half as hard as he got set down, then it was worth throwing because it helped assist in setting him down softly. He's coming down ultimately in a stall, which is softer than just falling out of the sky for sure. But coming down in a stall with half of a reserve is even softer than that. So let's keep going and we can see it's just in this spin. It's stuck, it's stalled. He's probably still holding a bunch of brake, continuing to spin the right side. And ultimately he ends up on the ground right here, which just 
doesn't look fun. It looked like a hard impact. Talk about a surface to land on. Nothing worse than landing on a bed of rocks. Again, I really hope this pilot is okay. I really just made this video to act as, as educational purposes. Let's break down a few of the key points that we learned in this video and talk about them. Okay, let's talk about the first key point. The first thing that you really want to do is avoid rotor, right? So the pilot in this situation ultimately encountered this collapse and led to this outcome because he found himself in rotor. So as a pilot who flies in mountainous environments regularly, a general rule of thumb that I have is that I'm always paying attention to the wind. I'm always paying attention to which way it's blowing. I'm always paying attention to the speed of it, and I'm always paying attention to see if it is changing. As you fly through these environments, as you fly through the mountains, as you fly through anything that has some size to it, you want to be aware of where the rotor is going to be. Paying attention to rotor is one of the most important things of mountain flying. In fact, it's arguably the most important thing. We call it the hidden dragon just waiting to bite you. You never want to enter into its den, which is rotor. So you have to be hyper aware of wind. Paying attention to the wind speed, paying attention to the wind direction is ultimately what's going to prevent you from flying into rotor. If you find yourself getting a little, you could say, rambunctious or uh, ignoring or not paying attention to the wind, that's when you can find yourself flying right into the rotor. So this pilot flew right into that rotor and you can see it can get ugly quickly. It is a good rule of thumb to just always avoid flying in rotor, to know how to find rotor, to know what it looks like, to know where it's gonna be, to know why it's gonna be there, and that way you can avoid it. If you guys are unsure on how to identify where rotor might be, reach out to us. We offer a progression training program where we can go into depth about rotor and would be happy to help you with that. The second key point is to not overdo your brakes when trying to recover. So this pilot took a collapse. He overdid the right side brake and instead of recovering from just a collapse, he ultimately entered into a spin which was even more difficult to recover from and he was unable to recover from it. It was not a collapse that he was recovering from. It was a spin that he was recovering from because he overdid the brakes when recovering from the collapse. This is something that is difficult to really learn how to do without doing two things. Firstly, this is a skill set that you start to build on the ground. The better you are at kiting, the better you're going to be in a situation like this. The kiting skill set of preventing and recovering from collapses while kiting is the same skill set to recover and prevent collapses in the sky. Does it directly translate? And if you're good at one, does it mean you're good at the other? No. Just because you're good at kiting and just because you're good at it on the ground does not mean you're necessarily going to be good at it in the air. However, it is the same. If you understand it on the ground and you know how to do it on the ground, you're going to understand it in the sky and know how to do it. Doesn't mean you'll do it, but you'll know what you're supposed to do. The other thing that you should consider is an SIV, which we'll talk about in a second. The third point that is a good rule of thumb is if you ever have a doubt about being able to recover from a collapse doubt about recovering from a spin or a spiral, or you're in a situation where you're just unsure if it's going to work. When in doubt, throw it out. And the answer needs to be, I'm throwing it and there's no hesitation and I'm excited to see what color it is. If there is any hesitation, if it's even on the table, if a reserve toss is even a possibility and you don't have a lot of time, it needs to be the go-to. In this situation, had the pilot been able to throw his reserve, the outcome could have been very different. Now, an accidental deployment where you throw your reserve unnecessarily, that's a different story. And ultimately, it's better than being in a situation where you should have thrown the reserve and didn't throw the reserve. I would so rather have thrown and not needed to throw than not thrown and needed to throw. The last point that I briefly touched on is an SIV. An SIV is a simulated in-flight maneuvers clinic that you do over water. This is something that in the paragliding world, most everybody does, but in the paramotor world is often overlooked. I personally was spoke against going to SIVs and didn't find them valuable enough for the average paramotor pilot. I then attended an SIV and have changed my mind on SIVs. I think an SIV is absolutely something any pilot over 50 hours should attend. You should really go to an SIV, especially if you are a adventurous pilot, as I would say, especially if you're a pilot that's going to find themselves in environments like this pilot did. 
big geological formations, big mountains, big wind, big rotor, big everything. If you're going to find yourself in environments like that, it is critical that you understand how that glider handles in those collapses, the possible outcomes, all of the possible situations, and how to safely recover from them. I was extremely humbled when I went to my SIV this year in July. I went to Max Acro Paragliding. I would highly recommend them. And no, they're not paying me to recommend them. They don't even know they're getting this plug. I just really enjoyed my time there. And I learned so much about how that wing handles handles, collapses, auto rotations, spirals, spins, helis, stalls, everything that a pilot may encounter in the real world, we were walked through in a very safe step-by-step -step environment, and it was an incredible learning experience. I realized how little I knew despite thinking I knew so much. That's often what bites most pilots. I would highly recommend you go to an SIV. I think it's worth considering if you are a pilot that wants to do these more adventurous type flights, please consider going to an SIV. All right, guys, as a wrapping up thoughts, I just wanted to hop on here again to make this educational video. I just wanted it to be this thing that we could talk about and learn from. By no means am I criticizing the pilot in any way, shape, or form. I hope he has a speedy recovery, and I know I've already mentioned that several times, but I really do mean it. I just wanted to come on here and see what I saw as an instructor and somebody with a little bit of experience in this situation. Thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you liked these videos. More videos like this are gonna come in the future. If you are interested in learning to fly a paramotor, we do offer a 10-day training course in Salt Lake City, Utah. Visit backcountryppg.com to learn more about that. Again, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.